Welcome everyone to our public lecture. Um, as you all heard, the recording is in progress. We are all being monitored here and we have, um, in addition to the regular Sincel audience, we also have a YouTube audience because it is an open general lecture. So it is my greatest pleasure and honor to introduce Marilyn Doctorum, who um, we all know because we're here. She's organizing those meetings. She created the Synthetic Cell Initiative in the Netherlands and then she decided the country's too small, let's spread it all over Europe. She created the Synthetic Cell Initiative, European Synthetic Cell Initiative. She's the main organizer. She's the main force behind our community, behind, o behind organizing our synthetic cell community. In addition to herding all of us into building cells, she's also an amazing researcher and we're going to see some of her research today. She's an internationally recognized um, researcher from TU Delft. She works on um, very biologically relevant um, cell motility, cell membrane, cell uh, protein problems. Um, among a lot of her um, accomplishments, I wanted to highlight one she received um, th in 2018, the Spinoza Prize, which is the highest um, honor a Dutch researcher can receive. And she published a lot of awesome papers, which um, all of we know. She mentored a lot of people. A lot of people present here are came through her lab, collaborated with her at some point. So um, in a way she's, um, the main organizer, the main backbone of the synthetic cell community, and now she will give us a um, general lecture about the promise of synthetic cells. Thank you, Kate. I'm <laughs> I'm not completely sure that's what we agreed to. <laughs> But thanks a lot. And uh, now, before uh, uh, starting, maybe I should just start thanking all of you and, uh, of course, the many people who organized this meeting and also that we've been collaborating with over the years and getting inspired by over the years. So it's a, a community. That's what we're interested in. I think uh, Kate knows very well what I'm talking about. So, so it's interesting. Um, so I, this is tonight is a public lecture about the promise of synthetic cells. And the idea is to give a glimpse of what, why we are here, wha what excites us. And of course, I don't have to tell you, but you are the audience that I see. So I'm going to also hopefully relate to you. But then there's uh, uh, the, uh, the online small uh, general public uh, that we cannot communicate with, unfortunately, but that is uh, uh, on a YouTube channel. So it's going to be a bit mixed. I'll, I'll try to explain you know, what, what excites us here, why we are here, who we are and show a little bit of the research also uh, of uh, our own group, but also of, uh, of what we are doing in the uh, Dutch uh, Consortium Basic, building a synthetic cell. So before I start, maybe I'll uh, go by, uh, you know, this works, by just explaining the all the logos that are on this first uh, slide. So starting at the bottom, this is my home, uh, the, the Department of Bio Nanoscience, uh, Faculty of Applied Sciences uh, at the TU Delft. Uh, we are also together with the quantum uh, guys, as I usually call them, part of the Kaffley Institute of Nanoscience at Delft. Uh, and, um, and, so and we are here uh, because of uh, uh, a meeting that we are organizing uh, with the community, as I said. So we are the uh, uh, European Synthetic Cell Initiative, uh, together with, uh, we started this with Petra Schwiller, who gave a talk yesterday, um, with... Um, Haken Bailey from the UK, uh, with Emmanuel Thierry, Laurent Bonchoir from France, and now also Jaime Rivas from Spain is formally involved. But this is sort of the formal core that is trying to, uh, uh, you know, to organize a, an office headed by Stefania. She's there, very important person in the back. Uh, but of course, there's lots of other scientists in Europe uh, who, who, uh, who participate. Also, industries, Rule is very uh, Bovenberg from BSM long time supporter of our European initiative. Thank you also. And, um, and the basic logo is here. So this is, as I will show mostly today, uh, is, a, is the Dutch consortium that received funding about four and a half years now ago, five years ago, uh, together to work for 10 years on building a synthetic cell. And in time, we are halfway in uh, you know, building the cell. I'm not so sure. Uh, and, uh, and this meeting, which is the synthetic uh, International Synthetic Cell uh, Meeting uh, 2022, is actually uh, organized together with the U.S. community uh, together, uh, uh, you know, behind this logo, build a, a cell. So it's very nice to have you here. I see there's people also from 
uh, from Asia. So, you know, we uh, maybe uh, we should have more logos here uh, next time. And before I forget, uh, this is uh, the meeting is the our second day. We will have another day tomorrow. And then we'll meet again May 22 to 24 in Minnesota next year. So we need to do that. So this is uh, where we are. So I'm going to uh, um, talk about cells, but just for the general public. And I think there are at least seven on the, yeah. Uh, they cannot communicate with us, but at least that we can show them who we are. So this is us. So this is uh, earlier today, uh, sort of uh, on the other side of where I am now, uh, when we were all gathering uh, for this picture. So uh, we, y you know, it's static, you cannot wave. And if you wave now, nobody will see us, but uh, I guess uh, that's, uh, that's the idea. So what's the plan? I want to uh, just explain what are synthetic cells or what do we call synthetic cells. Actually, if you ask different people, you will get slightly or maybe very different answers. And it starts, of course, by explaining what cells are. And it will be all, you know, uh, yeah, um, very rough and, and short, but at least to give you an idea. Uh, the promise of synthetic cells, so this is looking way in the future, eh? we are talking and I will show you fancy movies and cartoons about how we dream to make cells, but it's very important to realize that this is a tough question. I think we've also, again in this meeting, discussed among us how difficult of a task it is if you're really serious about building a complete cell. Of course, there's all kinds of intermediate steps or earlier steps that are also equally interesting and with for that we actually we've seen a lot of uh, progress i think at this meeting of all kinds of new tools new building blocks uh, that are being developed which i will also at the last slide summarize a little bit although not in a very comprehensive way and so i will talk about wha why is it so difficult and and what uh, what has been achieved but what is still to do and then have uh, uh, maybe two slides on you know, what does may this mean to society? So the promise of synthetic cells is, you know, once we are successful, what could we do with it as a society? But the last part is what is the maybe impact would be. And we've learned from a lecture last night uh, that uh, it's important to, you know, to not just talk among ourselves, but also ask uh, the general public who is now not able to communicate with us. Uh, <laughs> what do you think? But uh, let's, uh, I'll give it a try anyway. So here we go. Um, just to start, eh, so the cells are the uh, basic unit uh, of all life. Our body, if you zoom in, uh, the building blocks, that th the smallest building block of uh, any life that is able to grow and reproduce autonomously is a cell. And basically this is a picture that I stole from a colleague of mine, Beatrice Beaumont, and I just liked it because of all the colors and the different uh, varieties in which life can take shape. And these are almost all, not all of them, not this one, for example, multicellular uh, complex organisms like ourselves. And it's just mind boggling the different kind of shapes and, 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 and I don't know, um, talents uh, these, uh, these multicellular organisms can take. But no matter which picture you like best here, whether it's the butterfly or I don't know, the slug or the, what is it, the puma, panther? Um, they're all built in the end of, of cells and all what, what we unite all these cells or what is similar to all of them that they have the ability to autonomously grow and divide. Of course, you need to feed them. Eh? It's not that they grow from air. Uh, there's uh, building blocks on a molecular scale that go in, but this, uh, at, the, at the basic uh, unit of these cells, these cells uh, are uh, alive. They can grow and divide. And that's equally true for these complex organisms uh, like us, as it is for uh, simple cells, like a, a yeast or a bacteria, as I will show uh, in a second. If you zoom in even further into single cells, and again, this is true for no matter which cell you take of what organism, uh, the building blocks of cells are molecules. So molecules are maybe a thousand or 10,000 times smaller uh, than the cell size itself. Uh, they are so small that we make artist impression movies instead of real movies uh, of these uh, molecules. And this is uh, quite by now quite an, a well-known and old movie artist impression of uh, one of these uh, molecules. It's a protein, it's a complex molecule uh, that is able to, in this case, carry a vesicle, a small compartment with, with material inside through the cell. So you have to imagine we're now sitting inside one of these cells and we look around and we see these molecules that are doing things. 
So, and this is, um, uh, it, it, this is just a single example of a, a literally a, a walking molecule, uh, but there's a whole zoo of different types of molecules that somehow together make this sile what it is. And they are the, the basic units. They themselves are not alive, as we call it. They are not able to grow and reproduce autonomously. Uh, but actually, uh, all these molecules are based on information in the cell, another molecule in the cell called DNA, which is coding information uh, for each and uh, every one of these uh, protein molecules. So every cell contains, uh, our cells at least contain, um, and not our cells, but all the cells of life that exist on Earth today contain DNA that codes uh, with, uh, with their um, molecular codes for, for proteins that can then be made by the cell to do all kinds of functions. So if you think, and now this is a, a, again a, a single cell, it's a real movie now because this is at the scale that we can with a microscope actually look at them. And this is a yeast cell, it's a single cell organism. And what you see in green is the genetic material, the DNA that I just talked about. And what is just, you know, no matter whether you study this 20 years or 30 years, it's still completely amazing that uh, each of these cells individually is able to duplicate a piece of DNA in green into two pieces of DNA, identical pieces, then grow twice as long and divide in the middle and it starts over. So it's autonomously growing and shrinking each time, making one extra copy of the DNA, growing exactly twice as long and dividing more or less in the middle and this is uh, just going on. And somehow this ability to autonomously grow and divide and the details will differ between different cells, it doesn't really matter, is all somehow the result of all these molecular building blocks inside these cells working together. And that's the big mystery still. So how, you know, how many of these molecules do you need to take? Which ones exactly? How do you have to put them together in time and space to make this possible? And this is, I think, the basic question that fascinates uh, us all, which is why we are here. So that's um, sort of the, um, the goal, at least, for some of us, of building synthetic cells, and this is again a cartoon, is to learn how to take molecular components, put them in a, we usually take an enclosed membrane that mimics the cell in such a way, uh, not that it looks like exactly like this cell, but that it gains the ability to autonomously grow and divide. So that's what this whole uh, uh, program is about, uh, learning how to go from the molecular scale, as we call bottom-up, to learning how cells uh, work. So this is just the uh, same cartoon, but now in a moving fashion. So uh, this is uh, sort of our fantasy of what this synthetic cell may look like. It will not look like this, but it's just, again, showing you the main uh, functionality that we're interested in understanding. And that is the, the, uh, this, this container, which is made of a membrane uh, that every cell has, is able to grow twice as big. And then uh, the DNA, which is shown here in red, makes two copies of itself one copy goes to each side and then it pinches up in the middle. So this is what we would like to achieve in the lab. So, and as I will show, we're still very far from that, uh, even though we like to show these movies and it looks very simple like that, it totally is not. Uh, and even though there's a lot of progress, uh, it's real, I would say uh, one of the, you know, the big open questions uh, of science uh, today to, to understand how, how this works. So I'm gonna take a leap forward and okay, what if it works? What if we are able to do this? What could it do for us? And now I'm going to introduce to you, and this is the promise of synthetic cells. So of course, we as scientists in this room would be just crazy uh, happy if we could just under do this because it would make us understand hopefully how real cells work. But if you are able to do that, you may actually also use these cells for purposes that are uh, hopefully of benefit uh, to society. So this is where I introduce uh, Charlotte. She's in the room here, but nobody can see her online. But uh, Hi, uh, my name is Charlotte she's introducing Gosse, herself, and I'm a uh, PhD researcher at Delft University of Technology. I work in the Dutch research consortium BASIC, or Building a Synthetic Cell. In our consortium, we try to build a synthetic cell from scratch. I work on designing and building the DNA that will be the basis of our synthetic cell. As you know, our climate is changing. We are in need of more sustainable production of, for example, fuels, plastics, and medicines. Currently, we produce those in chemical processes, 
and these use fossil fuel. In biotechnology, we can make industry more sustainable by using microorganisms instead of chemical processes. In the coming few minutes, I will show you how we do this and why we do this. In my lab, we study yeast. Yeast is a type of small fungus that is known for being able to produce beer and bread. Besides making beer and bread, yeast can also produce certain biofuels like bioethanol. In my lab, we study how we can change the DNA of this yeast so it can also produce other valuable compounds such as medicine or bioplastics. Alternatively, we can also work on uh, changing what this yeast eats. For example, we could develop yeasts that eat plastic or even eat CO2 from the sky. Although products produced by yeast are slowly entering the market, it is still pretty difficult to do this at an industrial scale. This is because the production of, for example, fuels or medicine by yeast is very slow. This doesn't make it very economically viable to actually uh, produce stuff with yeast. Instead, it's much cheaper and easier to use the chemical processes we already have, but those are bad for the environment. The reason why these biotech processes are so slow is because we are working with actual living organisms. And making medicine or biofuels is not their prime task. They don't necessarily need to do it. Therefore, if we want to use yeast in industry, we will have to engineer it. And before we can engineer this yeast, we will have to know how it actually works. By building a synthetic cell, we can gain the knowledge on how cells exactly work, and we can use this information to engineer yeast as the perfect organism for industry. Additionally, by building a cell from the bottom up, we can design cells in any way we need. We can, for example, make a cell that produces antibiotics, or make another cell that specifically produces biofuels. With this method, we can design cells for any purpose we want. The DNA is the blueprint of the cell. It determines exactly what a cell can and cannot do. In my research line, I develop a kind of DNA Lego, a method in which we can click different pieces of DNA together so we can test different functions of the cell in different combinations. This will teach us a lot about the cell. For example, what the basic requirements of life are. It will also give us the knowledge that we currently need to build the perfect biological factory to make industry more sustainable. Okay, I think this was, you know, I could never explain it better than Charlotte did, so <laughs> thanks a lot for that. And, um, but it's far in the future. So, uh, and if you were not here, I would show this kind of slide uh, explaining that uh, wouldn't it be great if we were could learn to build things the way uh, nature does, and we would have uh, potentially all these applications in mind. So I'm not going to go through it again, except to explain the sort of the, uh, the, the slogan that uh, nature uh, could be our next uh, technology. Okay, so this is very far in the future, and it could be very useful for us, but we are uh, at the early stages. So just let me uh, give you a little bit uh, of, of at least how we approach this this, this, this task in our Dutch uh, consortium. So first of all, even if you uh, think, if you limit yourself, and in this meeting, uh, there's actually a lot of cellular functions that we've discussed, but within our Dutch program, we limit ourselves, which is uh, not limiting at all, it's already very complex, uh, to the ability, as I already explained, to grow and divide. But even if you are just asking uh, a mimic of a cell, and again, it will be very simple compared to a real cell, you have to already worry a lot of, a lot of progress. I won't go through all the details, but uh, it's already asking uh, a lot. So then that's on the pessimistic side. On the optimistic side, we could say, okay, but we know the blueprint of, of uh, many organisms. Uh, and so we know if you want the molecular parts uh, because we know the genome sequence. In other words, we know the code of bacteria, of yeast, of us. And we even know from the Greg Venter Institute that it takes a few hundred uh, unique uh, codes for pro proteins to make at least uh, a viable natural uh, cell or minimal uh, cell. So we know the, the components, but as I already explained, what we have to learn how to do is how to put these proteins or these molecular building blocks together, uh, ask, you know, how does a, a living cell or this ability to grow and divide emerge from these interactions and what are minimally required. So we have 
decided to take what's called a, a bottom-up approach by starting with the molecules and also a modular approach focusing uh, within our consortium on, sorry, oops, on three um, modules, which is self-fueling, it's the ability to make energy carrying molecules, uh, to process DNA, which means reading from DNA to protein, but also duplicating DNA, and then the ability uh, to divide. So there's not yet here communication, there's no motility, even though we've discussed it in this meeting, uh, we are sort of stay leaving that out uh, for the moment. So we originally put together a group of scientists, again, this is just a Dutch consortium, of course, the community is much bigger, uh, with specialism in these three different modules, uh, but also uh, theoretical uh, modelers, uh, uh, top-down uh, uh, gene, uh, genome engineers, and as I will get back to later, also a philosopher, uh, thinking also about the ethics of this problem. By now, this group has grown, so this is the original consortium, and I think now five or six uh, extra young group leaders have actually joined uh, the effort. And maybe what I, uh, uh, okay, I should not go too quick. So these are all specialists, for example, Bert is here still, Holman, uh, a specialist in metabolism in synthetic cells. Uh, Christophe Danelon, he was here earlier, he's uh, using selfie systems, like the pure system that we heard about earlier to express proteins in selfie systems, and I'm on the a mechanical side uh, interested in cell division. So I will uh, take a step back and just talk a little bit about cell division and how we try to build uh, cell division machinery in artificial cells. And uh, actually I start with cells that are way too complicated in a way for our purpose, but they are very beautiful movies. So this is pictures of how our cells divide. Uh, so many, uh, actually even the yeast cell that I showed at the beginning uses some version of this mechanism. So you see three different versions of a cell that is dividing and uh, dividing here, I specifically mean uh, the, the, the first the segregation of the DNA, the taking apart the copies of the chromosomes, the DNA, and then eventually dividing in the middle. And uh, what you see is uh, that in complicated cells like ours, there's actually multiple pieces of DNA uh, these blue things here, each of them duplicate, and what, uh, what these cells, uh, sorry, it's not a looping movie, are really uh, able to do is to position these chromosomes in the middle, pile them apart, and then constrict in the middle. So that's uh, the real version of what I showed in the cartoon earlier, showing that it's already more complex. Of course, this is also a fairly complex cell. So we ask, can we uh, rebuild this machine? It's called the mitotic spindle, the kern spool in Dutch, uh, in a very minimalistic way and, and learn how to use that minimalistic spindle uh, to segregate pieces of DNA for the purpose of our synthetic cells. That's sort of our task uh, within the consortium, uh, not just ours, but what we uh, focus on. So it's maybe good to know, and this is what uh, our group has been working on for long times, that these green wires that you saw that were putting the chromosomes in the middle of the cell uh, and pulling the chromosomes, the pieces of DNA apart, if you zoom in to them, to the molecular scale again, like we did in the earlier movie, you would realize that these are hollow tubes that are not static. They're like filaments that constantly grow and shrink. And by growing and shrinking, they can hook up to the DNA, grab the DNA, of course, it needs some other molecules, and eventually by shortening also pull the DNA apart. So we take these dynamic filaments and then put them in artificial cells. And the artificial cells that we make or that we use uh, uh, for the moment. Eh? Eventually we want to go to these membranes, these closed membranes, vesicles that I sh introduced in the beginning. But this is an intermediate simpler step where we uh, have bubbles of, of an interior of the cell water, if you want, inside an oil environment that we can easily make on a microfluidic chip. So sometimes, you know, I get a bit more technical. It's not because, uh, especially online, I should look um, uh, you need, uh, the details need to be understood, but it's just to show you that we can, uh, in the lab, make mimics uh, of cells in the, in the sense that these are enclosed structures that are roughly the size and the shape of real cells. And then we can put these dynamic filaments uh, inside by taking the building blocks of these filaments, proteins again, uh, that will spontaneously self-assemble into these growing and shrinking uh, wires. And I'm skipping a lot of steps, but what we are in the end able to do 
is uh, to turn this beautiful real spindle into a much more simplified mimic of a spindle that is at least within the confined space of this artificial self, self-organizing itself in, uh, in the same way as this spindle does. What is of course lacking here for now is that we want this spindle now to grab pieces of DNA and pull them apart. And this is uh, where we have to go uh, next. But it's the first step. It's one of the building blocks that we have uh, to eventually uh, put together with other building blocks in our effort to, uh, to make it all work together. So this is now maybe a bit for the audience more here that uh, actually uh, if we want to have a, a filament system that is able to uh, hook up to pieces of DNA, plasmids and pull them apart, and we want to do this in a cell-free system where uh, the filament is actually encoded by the DNA present in that cell-free system, then we better go away from this complex uh, uh, kind of uh, filaments that we find in our cells and we instead uh, switched our efforts in the last years to what the are called bacterial filaments. So there's simpler versions of these tubes found in simpler cells that have the advantage that you can express them, for example, in the pure system. And then would the plan is to use these kind of filaments in our minimal spindles uh, for synthetic cells. So we don't know, I haven't decided yet exactly which one. This is a, a called uh, a bacterial microtubules for the experts. So this is BTOP A and BTOP B, which together with Christoph Danelon, who I already introduced, uh, show that it can indeed can be expressed in a cell-free system. So what you see here are vesicles uh, with the pure system inside. So this is no, no longer uh, these uh, droplets, these bubbles of water in oil, but it's real enclosed vesicles. And we can uh, put the DNA coding for these filaments inside these droplets. This is what Johannes Catan did in a shared project with Christoph. Uh, and then this DNA uh, will be translated into the proteins that then spontaneously make these filaments, which for the moment are just deforming the vesicles into elongated shapes. And, uh, and this is then one of the candidates where we now have to learn how to hook up these filaments to DNA and organize them in such a way that we can actually segregate DNA in our dividing cell. We're not there yet. An alternative uh, filament that we're also studying because you never know what would work, so we have multiple approaches, is what you could see on a poster here uh, this morning, I guess, uh, is the PAR system. So Yash, I don't know where you are, uh, in our group is working together with um, uh, Reza, Kuhn and uh, Eli, on uh, on this alternative other alternative bacterial filament and another thing that we're trying to do is to not only make these filaments hook up to pieces of dna for segregation purposes but the mole molecules that you need uh, and again this is now a bit more technical again uh, to hook up the dna to these filaments we want to make them light inducible so the idea being that we can uh, have filaments and dna ignoring each other in the cell then shine light such that they hook up to each other uh, and then uh, the growth and shrinkage of these filaments uh, can segregate the DNA uh, the way we've seen in the complex spindle. So that is uh, the plan. So this was just to give an, uh, an example of the kind of tools we are building and how far we are or how, you know, how far we still have to go. And uh, I'm just going to put that in perspective of what is going on in the rest of the consortium. So the next slide is, I guess, the ugliest one, the most technical one. <laughs> but it's just to give maybe you here in the room an idea of where, as a consortium, what kind of discussions we're having at the moment of you know, what to do and what not to do. Because, OK, we can, uh, have put f uh, we can express filaments in vesicles and it does not hook up yet to DNA, but we have ideas how to do it, and that will eventually be good for cell division. But we have, uh, if we go from left to right here, eh, if we have these cartoons of what our cells in the end need to do, they need to grow, uh, they need to have pieces of DNA, and we're discussing, should these be single pieces of DNA or multiple pieces of DNA? Uh, should they uh, uh, you know, divide themselves randomly over the two new cells? Uh, should we have uh, single copies that then get pulled apart like we are trying to do or is maybe entropy going to help and if all this is done then we need to somehow split these cells in two and it could be if all goes really uh, fancy could be symmetric and well controlled 
but we could also maybe allow for not so symmetric and not so well controlled uh, cells in the DNA. So we're, uh, and, and we have progress, like Christoph is able to replicate DNA inside uh, these uh, vesicles uh, in, in, in bad hormones left in Groningen. ATP synthesis is uh, working, lipid synthesis is working. So there's all kinds of elements in this whole process and, and we probably need Petra here somewhere at the end uh, to divide uh, these uh, cells. So we're all making uh, progress, but it's also clear that to put it all together is still a daunting task. So as a consortium, we made this slide basically to discuss how to cheat and uh, to cheat to have something something working on a shorter time scale. So we said, okay, if we the simplest we can think of probably has multiple copies of the genome, we let them randomly separate, and then every now and then, if they even if they divide asymmetrically, there will be maybe one that has the right amount of DNA and can survive, but it's not very well controlled. So we think this is sort of the simplest asymmetric cell we can think of. And even then we think that the autonomous ATP synthesis, lipid synthesis that we're able to do is probably not fast enough and will not give enough to grow the right size. So we're going to allow to actually feed with complex molecules for a while as well. And then we said, okay, in addition to this, um, the, the, well, arguably simplest cell, we're also going to try to make something divide symmetrically. But all this more fancy control with proteins, we're probably going to push beyond uh, the scope of, uh, of this first uh, uh, project. So it's just to give you an idea of part of the choices uh, that we're trying uh, to make. And uh, again, always with uh, the, the common goal in mind to have some level of autonomous growth and, and division. And you see there's blue li letters here, which we means we will initially allow to complement the autonomous growth with some external feed. And we may also use external control like the light that I just introduced to uh, to synchronize things because uh, I didn't emphasize, but uh, I did it a little bit in the beginning. But if this one is to work and then work all over again, it, you have to coordinate in time that the duplication of the DNA happens once exactly when you grow twice as big and you divide once. So this temporal color coordination is an yet another level of complexity, which we are also going to initially allow uh, to cheat on a little bit, for example, with the use of external light. So it's just uh, giving you a glimpse into our thought process uh, within the consortium at the moment. And even with this uh, sort of uh, simplifications, it's, uh, it's still uh, a lot of uh, challenges to make it all work together, even though the progress on each of these individual uh, parts is actually sometimes uh, quite uh, uh, amazing. Okay, that was the ugly technical side. I'll go back to, you know, what if it works? So this, I hope, gives you an idea uh, of, of um, you know, of, of, of where we are and what still needs to be done. And uh, I, I, I said it already, I think, but we had many discussions in this meeting that, uh, you know, with all the experiments we do, we learn more how, how difficult it really is uh, to, uh, to achieve this final goal. But life is able to do it, cells are able to do it, so we will find a way, uh, uh, we think. So what if it works? And I'll get back to this picture. It's a picture of a baby shower of a cell that is a synthetic cell that is born. Uh, but I'll get back to you where this uh, picture comes from. <laughs> so I said uh, already in the beginning, if you know we make it work in the end, uh, then there's all kinds of opportunities that we may have. We may have learned a lot about how life works, and we may have uh, more sustainable ways, as Charlotte explained, of producing uh, things for all kinds of application areas. But you, there may also be questions. Uh, if we do develop this kind of technology and that we also, and this is why Huub Swartz, who you've met here in the meeting, also is involved in the process project. You know, uh, there's of course very interesting philosophical questions. When will you call this synthetic cell alive? Uh, there's a, th I think the discussion about what life is is much older than any attempts uh, uh, that we are working on in the, the lab. Uh, there may be ethical issues, you know, what are you doing? Are you creating life? Should you be creating life? Safety concerns. And also interesting, we heard about yesterday, there may be concerns about who owns this technology in the end. It will be great to have uh, environmental friendly ways of producing things, but will it be available 
to, uh, to, to everybody uh, who could benefit it or not. So all these questions, and I'm, uh, we had a long discussion about it yesterday, so I'm not going to repeat it, but if you're interested, and also people who are watching, uh, there's a, a, a position paper written, just published last week. You can find it on the website of the Ravenau Institute. It's an institute in the Netherlands that thinks about societal impact of uh, new technology. And basically, this uh, we together with them put together what's called the future panel to think about these questions. And if you read the document, <laughs> uh, you know you you will see it's full of questions, not that many answers uh, yet. Uh. So I will not uh, go into these re recommendations, but basically um, uh, the other question is: Okay, what what will be the impact on society, or what will the public think it? the impact will be, or what would the public want the impact to be? And this is where I come back to the baby shower. So as part of this uh, collaboration with the Rathenau, we also involved a designer, Mies Loofman, a quite a young artist. You can find her online if you want. And she presented uh, her thoughts or her work about the synthetic cell at the Dutch Design Week uh, last year in Eindhoven which is where she had this uh, baby shower for the synthetic cell and used this as an uh, opportunity to just ask people who were coming to the designer week, uh, Dutch Design Week, and, and watching this, uh, uh, this baby shower, what, what they thought. So since you know, we have a public here online, but as I said, there's a one-way communication, so I cannot ask uh, what, you know, what the public, what kind of questions uh, you may have, but Mies did, so she asked people, what they thought. And I'm going to uh, try to, uh, she made a podcast, it's actually quite long, it's half an hour, it's also published on the website uh, of the Rathenau last week. She made four podcasts uh, about the science, uh, she interviewed us, but the last one, number four, is about uh, this Dutch Design Week, and if you're interested, you can listen to the whole thing, it's in Dutch, uh, it's a half an hour, so I'm not going to run the whole thing here. But it has English subtitles, so at least I'll show you a little bit of that, uh, including the English subtitles. So now we're going to have the subtitles. Welkom bij Herschept. In deze serie onderzoek ik hoe de mens met het maken van een synthetische cel het leven herschept. Hiervoor neem ik een duik in het Nederlandse onderzoek Building a Synthetic Cell, wat in het kort ook wel Basic wordt genoemd. Tien jaar lang bouwen onderzoekers van zes onderzoeksinstituten aan deze kunstmatige cel. Deze cel zou ons uiteindelijk het antwoord kunnen geven op de vraag hoe het leven werkt. Maar hoe denken de bezoekers van de Dutch Design Week over de ontwikkeling van de synthetische cel? Waar hopen zij dat deze cel aan kan bijdragen? Moeten we ons zorgen maken? En welke adviezen willen ze meegeven aan de overheid en de wetenschap? Dat ga ik in deze aflevering onderzoeken. Can you fast forward to about ik seven ben Mies Loofman en samen met het... Ja, yeah, just a bit further. Ja, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so I'm just showing en, en, ja, small natuurlijk, ja, um, Alles bestaat natuurlijk uit cellen, maar dat dan met synthetische cellen gaat, heb ik weinig verstand van eerlijk gezegd hoor. <laughs> In de gesprekken komt het vaker voor dat de mensen overvallen worden met vragen over deze voor hen nog onbekende cel. Ze denken dan ook vaak dat ze er nog niet over mee kunnen praten, maar niets is minder waar. Daarom vragen we naar hun dromen voor de synthetische cel. Ik, ik denk ook vooral in de gezondheidszorg, om mensen te kunnen helpen met dingen die, die, uh, die niet meer goed gaan in het lichaam. Dat zou ik wel heel erg mooi vinden. Ik denk meer in, in uh, oplossingen hè, van problemen met de natuur of met afvalverwerking. Of, dat zou dan natuurlijk ook wel heel mooi zijn. Dus, Iets op eet misschien. Bijna iedereen die we spraken, sprak de hoop uit voor positieve mogelijkheden in de medische wetenschap. Of ze kwamen met de wensen voor een beter klimaat en het herstel van natuur. Naast hoop hebben bezoekers ook zorgen en vragen over de synthetische cel. Zo ook Bart en Sophia. Ja. Maar ik weet natuurlijk niet wat de synthetische is. Hè? Is, het dan, is het synthetische cel... Is dat dan de plastic of de nylons of de... Ja, ik begrijp daaruit dat het synthetisch is, dat wij hem gemaakt hebben. Ja. Wij creëren hem zelf. Ja. Ja. Ja, ja. Ja, ja. Het is niet van plastic gemaakt. Nee, 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 nee. nee, nee. Het groeit vanzelf. Het moet wel groeien. Het is belangrijkste 
Nou, toen stopt hij dus. Waar stopt het? Daar zie ik toch echt grote angst dat iets gaat boekeren in de natuur, als, omdat het vrij komt. Het ontsnapt, zullen we maar zeggen. In ja, het lichaam. Ik, ja. Voor nu is het idee dat deze cel alleen kan leven Dit is in een Celine, lab. Hè? En het mooie aan zelf kunnen Celine? bouwen van een cel ja. is dat we er ook zelf een stopknop in zouden kunnen bouwen. <laughs> dus dat die, als je er bepaald iets mee doet, dat die dan niet meer kan delen. Ja, ja. En dat het dan stopt daar. Het DNA van een, uh, een boom okay, van 6 meter. Oké, je kunt stoppen meter. het hier. Maybe if you click, uh, dus niet meer just hoger on the dan side. Meter. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so you, you heard Celine actually, uh, one of our PhD students in, uh, in Delft, who was also there at the Dutch Design Week, uh, trying to answer sort of questions. But what I find very interesting is that people are also quite optimistic, thinking about, you know, what it may do and positive things. And of course, asking, you know, what if it gets out and if we cannot stop it, it's alive. And so I think uh, I didn't actually listen to the whole podcast yet, uh, but, uh, but it could be interesting. And so just... You know, like I said, we don't have the opportunity now to have these kind of questions from the public, but this is what we might expect. So again, no, uh, you know, no further answers here. Uh, I'm just going to uh, finish by uh, giving you my little glimpse of I, I, I explained or tried to explain what excites us, uh, what, uh, what we mean when we talk about building synthetic cells, what we may use it for in the end. Um, And, and that it's still uh, a, a really big challenge to actually uh, get there. But we are here at a meeting, so there were lots of uh, parallel sessions with those presenting their work. And what I think is really amazing to see, even though you know the final goal of something growing and dividing, of course, is very difficult, it's amazing how many tools we've seen develop, the building blocks, people looking at communication be cells, between cells, Uh, simple versions of cells that can be used for all kinds of other purposes already. So there's a lot of uh, creativity, I think, going into this field where uh, things are developed that are already useful in scientific research and possibly also in applications, uh, not growing autonomously yet, uh, but still uh, providing a lot of progress. So this is a completely non-exhaustive list of just things that I saw that I thought were interesting. So we can now do the 3D printing of organelles with DNA in vesicles. There were actually, I believe, four people who were able to well, uh, give me talks about this. We've seen uh, ferrofluidic cells uh, interacting with real ones. So we see hybrid systems. Uh, first versions of synthetic cells interacting with real cells, uh, which provides all kinds of interesting opportunities. Uh, we've seen cells communicating with light. So synthetic cells, again, they don't grow and divide, but they can talk to each other. So this is uh, working, even though we've completely ignored that aspect in our in our uh, project and then things that I didn't understand so well yet the hybrid hybrid systems uh, that we've seen from uh, Spain uh, we've seen uh, there was somewhere synthetic cells in mice this I completely missed so if somebody can tell me about uh, this uh, but this is all the interesting things uh, that I at least uh, some of the interesting things that I uh, see uh, coming by um, Then there's also people who get really inspired. Uh, we've seen uh, Mies already, but I don't know who made this uh, picture, but it was on Twitter. It says late night art. Is I think uh, he or she, I don't know, here. Yeah, you made that. Sorry, I picked it from uh, <laughs> Twitter. And of course, this, this, this late night art was inspired by what was quite a, a spectacular, I think, talk that I missed also by Petra. Uh, and this is a picture from the poster on the same topic, uh, uh, which is uh, was uh, the, the opening talk yesterday, where you already see things being combined. So sometimes uh, uh, combinations of things work. So this is now a mimic of a bacterial cell uh, that is actually uh, building a structure in the middle that should help it divide, and the first steps of that are moving. And to And this is even more sophisticated than that because it knows where the middle of this structure is because there's this protein, this, this glow of orange uh, orange pink molecules uh, going uh, left and right. And this was, I think, her talk yesterday at three o'clock. But just a few hours before that, Celine and uh, Marijn were explaining the exact same experiment showing how you can actually express these proteins in the pure system, in a cell-free system, in the lab. Oops. And uh, they were, uh, so you see here the, the bacteria, this is the source of inspiration for this, that uh, they are expressing these proteins. And yesterday morning we were explaining to this uh, nice lady in green, now th this is not a question for the Dutch people, 
is a question to everybody else who recognizes this nice lady in green. Yeah. Anybody? No, it's our queen, Maxima, who was visiting the lab uh, yesterday. Uh, so uh, uh, looking at, uh, at our synthetic cell, a European uh, project. So that's going back in time, late at night, in the evening, uh, or in the afternoon, and uh, early in the afternoon. And then I think I'll, I'll stop by showing what happened really early on in the meeting, which was also quite spectacular. Also shown on Twitter, which was a real experiment. So, uh, you know, we have uh, artists uh, or, or people getting inspired. Uh, and we have all kinds of progress and we even start to have activities of building these cells, even though they're first steps live uh, in our meeting. So thank you, Kate, for doing that uh, yesterday. And with that, uh, I'll stop. Thank you so very much. Um, I think we all were excited about building cells. Now we're really, 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 really excited. <laughs> um, questions from the audience? We could also just go and have beer, eh? I guess. Eh? <laughs> that too. <laughs> to earn a beer, you need to ask a question. Mm -hmm. And questions from online. If there are any questions um, from people online, we can do that. Or if there are questions from people here, um, so let me start maybe. Um, so this is going to be question more kind of skewed towards the science part of it. But if you were to bet your money right now, what is going to be the first autonomous division system? Is it going to be FTFZ protein ring based or? No, I think it's going to be lipid. Um shape based uh, so basically uh, yeah I would think lipid based yeah but of course uh, there's two things said uh, so there's the, the the constriction which is maybe the relatively easy part and then there's the actual fission so you uh, so one of the things we were thinking about with this external feed so we want to also make a life on a chip where we uh, sort of run vesicles in a in a circuit let's say and then at different places maybe add um, lipids that will change the volume to area ratio, change the curvature, and then maybe we will initially need an extra trigger to, to have this final pinching off. So I think more likely a lipid based will be first. Yeah. yeah. I like that, being a lipid person. Mm. Um, any questions I'm from not, the. So <laughs> <laughs> any questions from the room? Um, if you could have one wish, and it's you can't wish for a synthetic cell, but no. like, you know, for one new thing, one extra component or technology or group of people or whatever it is, like, uh, to help build a synthetic cell, what would you wish for? Well, what would be your answer? Yeah. No, of course. What what is our weak point? And I'm our. Right. I mean, very close to us is that you know we are too much bottom-up in a way. Yeah? So y I think you need some kind of creativity or engineering spirit, and that's I'm sure also why you're asking, <laughs> uh, to, to, yeah, to, yeah, to, to force shortcuts and to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, because we are very bottom-up and maybe we need uh, also there a bit of hybrid uh, and cell-free systems, maybe that will uh, be really needed initially. So, and that's all fine. Uh, so and and in uh, yeah so as 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 a community i think we we have that complete spectrum which is you know it's very nice to have this coordinated program in the netherlands but it's taking one angle to the problem and and we probably need all of these different angles and and then who knows where it will uh, come from first yeah okay, doesn't thank matter you. <gasps> I find it hilarious that we're using cell-free systems to build a cell. Well, it was <laughs> just, uh, we were just discussing with Paul. Eh? I mean, he showed this, this slide where uh, you take cells. To make the lysates, you take cells, you spin them down, and you can always go back. You can dry them and still go back. And then there's this lysis step. And after that, you can never go back. And then at the end of his talk, it was, well, we should use this cell-free system as a basis for the cell. So but you think all you have to do is put the membrane around it and then you but that doesn't work. So and Sounds then simple. Yeah, but then then we discuss maybe you should, you know, do that lysis step extreme in a very subtle way and just see 
yeah, now when is the point of no return? Because it's crazy that, uh, yeah, maybe that's what we should be doing with those experiments. We just had a paper, except that with Wilhelm, which I don't think is here anymore, about yeah. how we tried, tried, tried it and failed. Yeah. So it's not that simple to put the membrane back together. No, apparently not. Any more questions from the audience? Go ahead. I mean, uh, th thanks for, for everything in general. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> he, he was supposed to do a postdoc uh, in our group, and then he... Yeah, thanks uh, for not hating uh, me. Yeah, so and then he didn't <laughs> come. Uh. <laughs> but, uh, like, you found that the, the basic, and it must have been an amazing thing, how in, in, in a relatively short time span it, it, it became the European synthetic cell, then we have the beat the cell, uh, American version and everything, but... Uh, Coming back to the if you had a wish kind of questions, like do, do you think this is the best way to approach the problem as a community? Do you think there should be a bigger consortium, sharing PhD, open source science in the community, or, or, or maybe actually no, every group should work a lot hard on their problem and then we meet every year. I mean, what's your dream? No, I, uh, I mean, if we knew how to organize that, there's also something that you can, yeah, it's like making all these cartoons about how the cell will work. You, it's, uh, you can sort of talk about or think about it, but the question is how to make it happen. And um, uh, so, so getting together more often, sharing resources, uh, protocols, all that is useful. But at the end of the day, the real the thing that works best is face-to-face -face contact, being in the lab together. But of course, all these other things can help, like sharing and not trying, uh, just, j just having a whatever you want to call it, healthy community where which is out there to help each other instead of trying, you know, it's so difficult anyway, so nobody has to dream to be the first to make it happen. It's it's going to somehow emerge uh, somewhere uh, yeah, only if uh, uh, yeah, we work together. So that I, I don't know if it's a dream, it's just something I enjoy. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Is there a number, maybe a, that you wish for, would $50 million a year and strong central program management to coordinate, so this would you is build a, a cell like that? Yeah, so we were hosting the Queen yesterday uh, in Delft, but we were also uh, hosting uh, Maria Gabriel, uh, the European Commissioner for um, uh, Research and Innovation and a few other things. She has a busy uh, portfolio. And to her, we would say we need a 100 million uh, coordinated European program <laughs> so that we can beat the rest of the world. Uh, so there we use the word beat. <laughs> Uh, because that, that uh, yeah, Europe, of course, wants to also, like everybody else, be independent when so it comes to new first technology. what would first prize be in that case? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, it's so that we help, I guess, each other to convince our politicians to invest uh, in this. Uh, but, yeah, uh, we had at some point in Europe this possibility of flagships, and it was like a billion. That's too much. Uh, it's too many, yeah. But... The, the, this this Dutch Zwaartekracht program, gravitation program, as it's called, you would need that at the European scale. So I don't know, hundred million, but maybe that's too, maybe it's not uh, ambitious enough. But that would that's at least what we argue for now in Brussels. So, yeah. uh, so I'm a bit curious about whenever you started everything and started organizing everything. <laughs> I stop. <laughs> <laughs> Y you know, I this meeting. I meant the general we. Yeah, as because in the, the people group. organizing it are there the, eh, in the back. The, uh, the group, yeah. when the group started organizing <laughs> this and came together and started yeah. collaborating, I was just wondering um, what brought about this very focused um, sphere on bringing in the public and how the philosophy so early on, which I think is really admirable. And I was just wondering how that started. Yeah, so I think it, it's not uh, not simply to our credit, I think. it's uh, uh, On this topic, it makes a lot of sense because if you say you're going to create cells, create life, you very, very quickly when you uh, get into these questions. And, uh, and when we first put this consortium together, I think it was Bert uh, who, who brought in, uh, Bert is gone, huh? yeah, he was uh, yeah, from Groningen, who brought in Huth Zwart, who is also gone now. So it, I don't re remember exactly, except that, um, that I it's not just for this topic, but in general, I think for this new technology development is something that also expected a little bit 
from when you apply, but it's, it also makes a lot of sense on this topic. It's actually also fun. And not just the, the, the make it safe and everything, but you see how the public is not focused so much on the safety issue, at least the people who come to the design week. I don't know how it's everywhere else. But also just the, 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 you know, the philosophy of it is uh, what is life? Uh, will this thing be alive or not? Uh, so it's, I think it's very interesting. So I it came quite naturally uh, in the beginning. And then it's really Hup uh, who brought in the Rathenau Institute. And this is their specialty. Yeah? So that the future panel got together. I, I We didn't think of that uh, in the beginning. That just happened because uh, Hup made that happen. Um, so you raised the question of uh, what happens if we succeed, and I want to raise the opposite question: what happens if we fail? <laughs> so what if tomorrow something actually, someone mathematically proves it's simply not possible to go ahead? Fine. And what yeah. do you think are, for now, the major achievements of the field? Something that the field and the community came up with that was already <coughs> worth going this way, because it has a value for science and society. Yeah, so I think that's, that really has to do with, uh, with the broader field of bottom-up biology, that, that building parts of cells from scratch just helps us. It's one of the ways to understand how, how a mitotic spindle works, how a metabolism works. So there you have the, the, the you know, cell biological experiments where you remove things. And, and you, so, so for I think there's plenty of examples of individual cellular processes where the complementarity between this bottom-up approach and the, the the live cell experiments together just bring us forward in understanding how cells work. I think there's examples of success in that sense all the time. And then there's also, I think, uh, it's not something I focus on, but technological advances using vesicles. Uh, I mean, to make uh, the selfie systems, you can make things already with it or use it to for biomarker production. I mean, Paul knows better than me, but there's a lot of uh, useful uh, technology that came out of it uh, already, maybe used in other fields of sciences. I mean, some people say the RNA, and that's a bit far-fetched, I would say, but, uh, you know, nanotechnology and the RNA vaccines that we now have, uh, you could make a link there as well if you want to push it, uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, so uh, what if we don't want to push it, right? Like, I mean, uh, you brought in so many different voices, but I mean, the question I'm asking myself is like, when are we done? Like, I mean, how would you define like the first synthetic cell that truly deserves its name? Like, what do we need to do as the final aim? In yeah, so to me, it means some form of reproduction. So not, I mean, that's, I think, the defining uh, ability to... Uh, so you could say evolving is important, communicating is important, but autonomously making two copies of itself, I think that would be, uh, uh, yeah, to me, uh, sort of a, a, a big milestone, yeah. So like, what if you could make something that, that would suck it like a macrophage and it could go through your body and it could eat other things, it just couldn't divide? Yeah. So, but th that could be very useful, you mean? Yeah, no, I mean, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't, I would call that a living cell. Yeah, I don't know. well. Yeah, no, I wouldn't because it cannot reproduce. So, uh, yeah, but that's, I mean, it is very funny when we had uh, uh, applied for the program, we had, of course, this discussion also with the committee and they said, oh, now, you know, a crystal can de replicate itself. If you take a salt crystal, it can make itself twice as big. So that's alive. It's like, yeah, okay. So you can always get into discussions by the exact meaning of your words, but I think we know yeah, what we mean by autonomously growing and dividing. And based on, and, and of course you can maybe think of all kinds of other non-biological systems that could do something like this, but we're talking here about a cell mimic, so something based on DNA and proteins, even though as a community there's a lot of effort, of course, with these hybrid systems that I, I mean, I didn't really explain anything, of course, but uh, the use of uh, non-biological molecules or supramolecular chemistry, so there's all kinds of other ways to make life-like properties that maybe eventually also could lead to a reproducing information carrying uh, um, life cell. Yeah. So it, it, the definition in the end, yeah, you can, uh, it's not, uh, yeah, it's 
it's not black and white. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions? So thank you very much again, Melanie. That was a real yeah. treat. And